And our reading today comes from um, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and starting at verse 20. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honourable use, some for dishonourable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonourable, he will be a vessel for honourable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace, along with those who call, all the, call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Thank you so much, Liz. This is where the Lord, I need my Bible. Hey. Can't do much without that. All right. Uh, if uh, you're just joining us and just joining us over here uh, later on, my name's Arnaldo. Would love to meet you if I haven't met you. Uh, but today, before I jump in, I want to just encourage you that if you've missed any of these messages from this series or from others, uh, you can jump on to our YouTube page and, and catch up. I encourage you to do that to get the full picture of what we've been preaching through this series. Uh, this is the penultimate sermon, so next week we're going to have a celebration Sunday. We're going to have some baptisms here, um, and so if you have not been baptized and you'd like to explore that, please let me know today, uh, and then we can organize uh, for you to also be baptized baptized next week. There's going to be a short sermon, and there's going to also be, I, I failed to mention, there's going to be an open mic next week. And so you've got 60 seconds, okay? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not giving you more than 60 seconds. 60, maybe 90, uh, but 60 to 90 seconds to be able to uh, stand up next week and share with the community here uh, how the Lord, how you can thank God uh, for how he's moved in your life, in your church, uh, in, in different ways. And so there's an opportunity for you to do that next week. Also, I want to mention, I haven't mentioned this, but we have recorded a limited podcast called Set the Sail that accompanies this series. Uh, so I should have told you like eight weeks ago when we started the series, uh, but you can catch up there. Half hour, um, uh, half hour episodes uh, where myself and Matt Sparks from Anchor City and James Dawson from North than beaches, we get together and we, we try to dig a bit deeper on some of the themes that we've been talking through. And so uh, those are just a few sort of ancillary things, but this teaching series has been a gift to me to preach. Uh, my sense is that the Lord has been kind enough to us to answer some of our prayers, uh, even as we continue to press in for, for more. We kicked off this series um, about a month and a half ago with a look at Zechariah's call to return to the Lord, a call, an invitation to repentance. And, and depending on what your church involvement has been, repentance can often seem or hear like a negative word, uh, but it is an invitation to life. It is an invitation to make a U-turn, to make a 180 degree turn and walk towards life. That's what repentance is. Then... We studied Elijah and the event on Mount Carmel where he goes up against these, uh, um, these 450 prophets of a false god called Baal. And he prays that the Lord would bring fire onto the altar that he brings, that, that he builds, and he does. And, and what we were called to that week is we're called to construct altars upon which the Lord can come and visit us in power. Then we looked at the doctrine of the new birth. Don't let that word scare you, doctrine. Doctrine simply means teaching, the teaching of the new birth from Ezekiel and from John in the New Testament. And we realized uh, that there's nothing that we can do in our own power to bring about even new life in us, let alone new life in the culture or in our area. Then we looked at uh, um, 
the reality that God is going to come where he is wanted, that God will not intrude on us, that God will, will come and he will visit us to the places where he is wanted. And so the cultivation of our desire for him, our desire to, to, to be with him, our desire to be shaped and transformed by him is going to be a key component to the reality of renewal, both personal and corporate. Then we saw that the presence of God that God being amongst us, God being in our midst is central to everything. Uh, that the whole story of the Bible can actually be uh, encapsulated with the phrase, the witness of God. That throughout the scriptures, as you follow the trajectory uh, and the story of the Bible, what we find is that there is a God who is stubborn, a God who is stubbornly committed to be with his people. Last week, we explored the reality that the church moves forward on its knees, that prayer is the lifeblood and the carrier, as it were, of revival. There is no revival. There will be no revival in your life. There will be no revival in this church. There will be no revival in any church, in any area, without fervent, consistent, persistent, bold, rude, pugnacious prayer for God to fulfill his own promises. And next week... We're going to be looking at a, uh, where it's all going, a beautiful inheritance from Psalm 16. We're going to be celebrating baptisms, as I mentioned, and stories of God's goodness as a church. But today, today, we're going to be looking at stewarding a consecrated life. What does it mean to steward a consecrated life? What does it look like? We'll be looking at what it looks like to be holy as God is holy to be faithful in contending in prayer and preparing not just our prayers, but our lives. Like, not just what we say, but how do we prepare? Like, if, you know, Paul talked about our, ourselves being as a vessel. How do we prepare this vessel that we have of our own selves, our own lives, and this church for the sake of renewal? But before we dig in, you know what it is. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for this word. We thank you that I don't have the burden of having to think up what to preach. Uh, Lord, all I want to do is open up your word and feed your people your word. And so to that end, Lord, I pray that you would help me to forget the things that I've prepared that uh, are not of you, that are uh, not for your people this day. I pray that you would help me to remember the things that are. And more than anything, Lord, I pray that you would draw near, that those who may have walked in not pledging allegiance to Jesus would walk out full of joy and assurance that you have saved them from Satan, sin, hell, and death. That is our prayer today. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And the church said, and the church said, we're living as I, we, we're, as I started the series, uh, reminding us that we are living in an age of decline in the church and in the culture. You've already heard me talk about the fact that there are about 3 to 5% of people in the Australian population who go to a gospel preaching church, which means that we have over 24 million people who are going straight to eternal damnation. Let me just start off with this apart from Jesus, okay? That, that's our reality. And if we, if we fail to recognize our reality, we will fail to respond to our time. This is tragic, and we live in an upside-down world, a time where some would call good evil and evil good. This is a time that the prophet Isaiah spoke about in Isaiah 5 when he said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And my, my job here is, is not to judge the culture, by the way. We don't judge culture in this way, right? Uh, listen, culture will do culture. Culture will be culture. We're 1 Corinthians 5 kinds of Christians. Paul says, let the culture be the culture. Like, our job is not to judge those outside of the church. Paul tells us that very, very clearly. Do not judge those who are outside of the church. But... When culture begins to apply pressure onto the church and tries to get us to call evil good and good evil, then we have a problem, and that problem is called compromise. 
Because at the very same time, we have theological and moral compromise inside. That's what I'm worried. I'm worried about who's inside the church right now. We're living at a crossroads. We live in a time where we are experiencing incredible pressure from outside and within to conform to the morals and the ways of our culture. That is a time you are living in. And you can be living in a time even if you don't recognize it or have a title for it. And you, 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 you know, you, if, if you work and you're out in the world, you know, you live with what, what uh, philosopher Charles Taylor calls cross pressure. We're living in something like a, a pressure cooker where we're feeling always the, uh, we're, we're bombarded from all sides. And as a result, we are tempted all the time, even me as your pastor, to compromise. And compromise is the enemy to the consecrated life. Compromise is the enemy to a consecrated life. We're living in a time of large-scale spiritual deadness to the deep things of God. Bishop J.C. Ryle, he said this. He says, There is a common worldly kind of Christianity in this day, which many have and think they have enough. A cheap Christianity which offends nobody and requires no sacrifice, which costs nothing and is therefore worth nothing. But as James Burns points out, even during times of decline, and maybe especially in times of decline, there is hope and there is opportunity. This time of spiritual deadness has its definite limits. The wave of spiritual progress recedes, but in receding, it is gathering in power and volume to return and to rush further in. God has set a limit to the defection of his church. When the night is at its darkest, the dawn is on its way. And this is the time that we're living in, God. Like, I'm trying to wake us up. I'm trying to to do something here to alert us to reality, I'm not just trying to give you a false religious balm so that you can feel better. I want us to wake up to what's really going on in the world. And it seems to be the case that the church in Australia is experiencing a deep darkness, which can only mean this, that we may be on the brink of revival. We may very well be on the brink of revival, and I want to prepare us for that. And I want to remind us real quick, what is revival? So what is this, listen, what is this thing that we've been talking about? I've given you different definitions, but I just want to, I want to give you another one just so you can remember what I'm talking about so we can all be on the same page that when I'm speaking about revival, what am I speaking about? And it's this, revival is those special seasons of divine visitation when God, the Holy Ghost, quickens and stirs the sleeping church of God, the slumbering church of God. Believers are set ablaze for Christ, and the power of God is so manifest in prevailing prayer and anointed preaching of the gospel that the most hardened and skeptical unbelievers are brought under great conviction of sin, leading in turn to genuine repentance and saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through his death on the cross and resurrection. That's another way of saying revival is God waking up the church and saving sinners. That's what revival is. It's nothing esoteric. It's nothing different from every uh, uh, what we've been pursuing all along. It is just praying that God would do this in a special way. This is what we're after, and this is why as a church we exist for this purpose, to pursue the presence of God for the sake of the world. And this is never never been clearer for me as a leader, as a pastor, that this is why we exist, to pursue the presence of God for the sake of the world. And so add to the theological and moral decay in the church, the culture is experiencing deep dissatisfaction, deep dissatisfaction with the secular story of progress. And we believe, I believe, that the tinder is set. I truly believe that God is going to set this thing aflame. And last week we learned that this won't happen without a church that is first humbling itself in prayer and repentance, humbling itself in persistent and persevering and bold and audacious and sacrificial and rude and pugnacious prayer. But there will also be no revival without consecration. And and this is what we're going to be talking about today. There will be no revival without consecration. There will be no revival without a church that says, use me. It just won't happen. 
God, God just won't do it without a church that says, and without a people that says, use me. Because without God, we can't, but without us, he simply won't. There always has been and always will be at the center of renewal, of revival, of outpouring, of visitation, our desire to pray, but also our desire for holiness, to be set apart for the purposes of God for the sake of his holy name. This is what Evan Roberts experienced in 1904 uh, during the Welsh revival on a Thursday evening. These are his words. It was a very powerful service. And at the close, Seth Joshua prayed, bend us, O Lord. Immediately, the Spirit of God bore witness to young Evan, this is what you need. Evan was gripped with the spirit of intercession. He himself recalled what happened in these words. I fell on my knees with my arms over my seat in front of me and tears flowed freely. I cried, bend me, bend me, bend us. Perspiration poured down my face and tears streamed quickly until I thought that the blood came out. Soon, Mrs. Davies came to wipe my perspiration away. When I was in this feeling, the audience sang heartily, I am coming, coming to the Lord. Now a great burden came upon me for the salvation of lost souls. He revealed later that what had overwhelmed him was a great sense of God's love and his own unworthiness. There will be no revival in this place, in this church, without that. Without, without a deep, deep, deep. You cannot just believe that God loves people generally. That doesn't work, okay? You have to get to the place where you know in the gut of your guts, in the bone of your bones, in the marrow, that God loves me and I'm unworthy. Two things that we cannot put into the same package. This is, this is paradoxical, that I don't deserve God's love, and yet he is glad to shower it upon me. There will be no revival in this place without this, without holiness. What, listen, why? Why would God bless and anoint our compromise? Why would we think that we could lead compromised lives and God would somehow bless that? How, how do we think? How, how did we ever get it into our minds that God would bless an unrepentant life? Now, don't mistake me because some of you already are. are. Are you saying that we must be perfect? No, you can't be perfect, but should you desire to be? That's the question. Is there a desire in you to say, I never, in my, I never want to offend God's majesty ever again. He's been so good to me. Why would God bless and anoint our unrepentant? Why would God bless and anoint and work through vessels that are more at home in sin than in his presence? Why? Why do we think that's the case? We, we somehow have, have, have figured this out, that we, we, we say something like, it is my job to sin and God's job to forgive, and we've made a deal here. That, that, that's how we, we operate. And this is why we need to believe, believe again. We need to begin to believe again that our living and our thinking and our willing and our desiring can listen it can it can resemble god's thinking and god's living and god's willing and god's desiring holiness must for us again become possible before it becomes desirable in our minds we need to think this is actually possible i can become holy as the lord is holy now listen to me listen to me this is what hebrews 12 says Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And so holiness is not only possible, but it's absolutely necessary. It's necessary. And this is what we're going to learn today. There is no revival without a consecrated church, which is to say there is no revival without a consecrated church people. Now we're going to do, listen, we're going to do a little bit of growing up theologically today. I'm going to call you guys up. I'm going to call you guys to, to, to construct some new categories for us, to do some synthesis, because we often, uh, again, one, one of the clarion calls through this series has been that God is actually calling us to put ourselves to work, okay? So what is 
consecration. But before us, that's the, that's, that's the question for us. What is consecration? It's not necessarily a word that we use every day, although it is surely a concept that we are familiar with. Kath and I have a bank account that's titled Bills, okay? And every single month, I, 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 am, I, am, I am exact with this, to the penny, okay? To the penny. On the first, when I get paid, I put exactly what we need for all of our uh, Netflix and all the automatic payments that we pay out of that account. Every single month, I put exactly, to the penny, what we need in that account. This is what we've done. We've consecrated that money. That's what consecration is. It's to set something aside for a specific purpose and to use it for any other purpose would be to misuse those funds. So we all do this. We, we all have some sort of financial scheme where we put money aside for automatic payments. That is, you are consecrating your money. You are putting it aside for a very specific purpose. And this is the same word group that we translate in the Old Testament as holy. That money is, is, is holy for something. It is consecrated for a specific purpose. To make something holy is to set this thing apart for special use. Consecration, John Wesley wrote, is destroying whatever of the world, listen to this, it's destroying whatever of the fallen world system is still in us. And this is the question. Do you, this is a real question, you must ask yourself this question. Do you want to be set apart for special use in the kingdom of God? That's the only question I have for you today. Do you have a desire? Do you even want to be set apart for special use in the kingdom of God? This is where we need to grow up theologically. We must form within our theological framework, our thinking, a space for the reality that we can be a useless Christian. Listen to me. We need to have a category in our minds, in our theological frameworks, where we can be useless Christians. I'm going to go back to a text that we visited over and over and over again. I need you to see this for yourselves so that you know that I'm not placing some man-made burden or doctrine on you. I need you to see this from God's word. Come back with me to Peter 1. It says this, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them, through the great and precious promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, listen to me, for this very reason, make every effort. Just pause for a moment. We were just told by Peter, Peter, you just told us that we have been given everything, everything for life and godliness. There is nothing you lack right now sitting in these chairs, nothing you lack to live a life of godliness, nothing. And yet, he says then, make every effort now. So we have this idea that because we've been given everything that we have nothing to do. Okay? And that's false. You've been given everything and that empowers you to do. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Listen to me here. For, because, if these qualities... For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you, they keep you, if they are yours and if they're increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge hmm, of our Lord Jesus Christ. For, listen, whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Now, I know that there are some of us here with a very soft and beautiful conscience that desire above all else to please God, but never, never are sure whether they are pleasing God or not. I'm not addressing you right now, saint. This is not for you. 
This is, the, listen, the fact that you have a soft conscience, the fact that you want to please God is evidence that there is life. This is not for you. This is for the presumptuous and the spiritually lazy amongst us. If this is the case, if it's the case, just follow with me, just logically. If it's the case that if these qualities are yours and are increasing, that they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful, then to not have them, what does that mean? Give me the opposite. What does it mean to not have these qualities and to not increase in them? It means that we will be ineffective and unfruitful. I'm not trying to beat y'all down. I'm trying to give you the word here. I'm trying to show you that it is possible to be loved by God but not be used by him. It is possible to be loved by God but not to be used by him for his plans and purposes in the world. To not, it's possible to be loved by God and not be vehicles of revival. And so we could be holy positionally, but not keep in step with who we are, thereby giving, thereby being of no use to the master. And I don't know about you. I don't want to play games. I don't want to play games with the devil. I don't want to play games with the world. I don't want to play games with my, I don't want to get to the end of my life and, and say like, th- that I've done nothing for the kingdom. I want to be used by God for his plans and purposes. That is my greatest desire. I want to say, with C.S. Lewis, he said, he said this. He said, you know, when I die, I want to be so in the game that when I die, the devils rejoice because I'm out of the game. That's what I want. I, I want to do some damage to the kingdom of darkness rather than perpetuate it with my life. I'm supposed to be a person of light, and yet here I am trying to perpetuate a kingdom of darkness? I want to be an instrument of righteousness in the world rather than an agent of chaos. I want to be a person of light and life and love rather than someone who is a liability to the kingdom of God. I want to increase, listen, I want my life to be one of the reasons why the praise of Jesus is increased in the world. Not why people say, this is why I can't go to church. Look at these people, right? I don't want that life. I want the life to say, man, there's something there. There's got to be something there. Jesus, there must be something more beautiful than health. There must be something more beautiful than riches. There must be something more beautiful than reputation because look at his life. That's what I want. I want people to see my life and say, isn't God wonderful? Look at what God can do with a redeemed sinner. This isn't about some snobbish, self-righteous religiosity. This is about turning to God and saying that my life is yours. Use me as you please. And this requires consecration. This is you saying this, that I refuse to be co-opted by the things of the world. This is you saying that the Lord, the Lord, we know, listen, we know that the Lord is looking for those who want to be consecrated to him. And this is why John says this. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and listen to how he, how he explains it, the desires of the flesh, which, real quick, this isn't speaking about materiality, okay? We're not Gnostics here. We don't believe that the Spirit is better than, than, than physicality, okay? When, when Paul, he, in this case, is talking about flesh, he's talking about the, the fallen things of the world, the things that are anti-God. The desires of the flesh... And the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, right? So there's desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and then and then having those things give us the pride of life. Is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And so this is saying no, okay, with your life, with your decisions, with your thinking, with your money, with your sexuality, with your time. This is saying no to worldliness. It's saying no to the things that our fallen flesh desires and our fallen eyes desire and our fallen selves glory in once we get them. It's saying this. I'm, I'm going to give you, listen, this sermon can be 10 minutes, but I'm just trying to give you different word pictures so maybe one of them can stick. It's saying this. I refuse to allow idols to take up residence in my life and in my heart. It's saying I refuse 
to cooperate with the kingdom of darkness. I refuse to compromise my sexuality. I refuse to take shortcuts on my morals. I refuse to give my worship that is due to Jesus to something else. And this requires consecration. It requires putting your justification to work. Listen, justification is this. Justification is the reality that right now, before God, if you are in Christ, if you've called Jesus your Lord and Savior, if you've confessed with your mouth that he is Lord and believed in your heart that he is Lord, you are saved. If that's you, justification is this, that before the eyes of God, I stand as Jesus stands, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus has done. And consecration is taking that reality and saying, I'm going to work that into my life. I'm going to make my, my actual life that you can see and taste and see, that you, that you can see and experience. I'm going to take that life and it's going to look like my justification. It's going to look like what's already true of me. We're not trying to achieve the pleasure of God. We're not trying to achieve justification. We're not trying to get saved by having a consecrated life. A consecrated life says, I'm already saved, and I want my life to look like my justification. I want to be what I already am in Christ. Consecration isn't taken up to earn God's love. It is taken up to learn God's love, to express God's love. It's not taken up so that we can put God in our debt by our good behavior. It's taken up to put the devil to shame. It's taken up so that we can say with our whole lives that God is better than life. Oh, could we get there? Could we get to the point in all of our riches in the West? And I don't, I don't, I don't care what kind of debt you're in today or what, what your bank is. We are rich, okay? Don't, don't get it twisted. You are rich. You may feel poor because we live in such an affluent society. We are rich. Would we say that God is better than life, that God is better than riches, than even of the good... That God is better than the good things of life. And so, let's decide. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to make a choice today. Like, actually make a choice to grow up theologically. Let's put down the false idea that expending great efforts means that we earn God's love. It doesn't. Effort is an action. An action that we're called to put into practice. Earning is an attitude. They're not the same. And so my call to you, my call to us as a church is to, from today, learn to live a life of consecration. And consecration involves two things. First, it involves cleansing and clarity. Okay, cleansing and clarity. Now, I want to be very clear here, again, that the blood of Christ right now cleansed you, has cleansed you from all unrighteousness. Okay? The blood of Christ has cleansed you from all unrighteousness. Right now, as I've mentioned already, you stand before God a saint. There's one word that's used to, to describe people in the New Testament who have turned to Jesus. Saint. Okay? Even the Corinthians. When we went through Corinthians. You saw how jacked up they were. What does Paul call them? Saints. The saints in Corinth. Okay? So right now, regardless of the sin in your life, right now, you stand positionally as a saint. You have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Your past, present, and future sin has been forgiven on the cross. There is therefore, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God calls you clean now because of the applied, finished work of Christ on your life. So when God sees you right now, saints, right now, right, like right this moment, I'm not, I'm not playing with y'all. There's, listen, there's a God, and he's on the throne, and he can see you right now. And you know how he sees you? He sees you clothed in the perfect righteousness of the Son, accomplished for you through his sinless life, through his vicarious death, through his victorious resurrection, through his glorious ascension of Jesus Christ. And so consecration does not earn you your standing before God. That is a pure gift. What consecration does is that it brings that legal reality of your, of your cleansedness in Christ, and it brings it into this realm. It brings it into this reality. It says, I will be in my life what I am already in heaven. That's what consecration is. It takes your current status in heaven and it reveals it here on earth. That's what pursuing righteousness 
does. It doesn't earn you righteousness. I feel like I'm a broken record here. Like I'm just giving, giving caveat after caveat. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm not trying to apologize for God's word here. I'm just trying to get you to see. I'm trying to get you to believe. I'm trying to get you to see from God's word that what consecration is isn't earning. It is revealing what you already are in Christ. It takes your current status in heaven, reveals it here on earth. It takes what is already true of you in the spiritual realm and exposes it here in the physical realm. And so consecration calls us then to cleanse ourselves, to cleanse ourselves. That's a thing that you, you, do, you do, okay? God has already cleansed you. Now you do it, okay? God has already cleansed you in the throne room of heaven. As you stand before him, you stand clean. And now he says, now you cleanse yourselves of the reality so that you can match the reality in heaven. Consecration calls us to cleanse ourselves in time and space, in the here and now of the things which we have already been forgiven of and yet still may have a hold on us. If anyone says they are without sin, he is a liar, John says. And this is why Paul explains it to Timothy this way, from the, 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 the words that were read by Liz a bit earlier. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone, listen to this, if, like, reckon, 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 with the reality that you don't have to do this. But also then reckon with the reality that God may not use you for his kingdom. That's up to you to decide. But just reckon that you can be very, you can be loved by God and not do this, okay? If, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good Work. And so check it out. Let's use the same logic that we used when we looked at Peter. It's possible to be in the master's house and not cleanse ourselves from the things that are dishonorable and thereby excluding ourselves from being in the running of being used mightily by God for honorable uses. That's a reality that the scriptures teach. It means that it's possible that we're not ready for every good work which he has prepared for us. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm not content to be in the father's house but not be about the father's business. I'm just not. That's not enough. That's, no. I, want to be, I, want, I don't want to just be a hoarder, right? I don't want to be a leech in the kingdom of God, getting all the benefits, but not going to work with the Father. I don't want to be in the Father's house and not be about the Father's business. I want to be used by God mightily. I want to be a vessel for honorable purposes in the world. I don't want to be saved by the skin of my teeth. I, want, I don't want to be surprised when I get to heaven. I want to be so soaked, listen, I want to be so soaked in God's presence now that when I finally see him face to face, we're not skipping a beat. Some of, some of y'all are going to be surprised by God because we don't spend time with him now. You expect him to, to, right? Like you, you, you know the kinds of friendships, you know the kinds of friendships, the types of relationships that you have such a connection with that even after years of distance, you see each other and you don't skip a beat. I want to feel at home in his presence from now. I want to smell like the throne room of heaven. I want the throne room of heaven to be my natural habitat. I don't want to just get by or just get in. I want God to use my life to show and declare his good character and purposes and will. I want to be used for honorable purposes. And this requires cleansing. But cleansing from what? Anything, listen to me, listen to me clearly, anything and everything that gets in the way of your enjoyment and your obedience to God. This is what we need to cleanse ourselves from. Anything and everything that gets in the way of your enjoyment and obedience. This sounds extreme to a compromised people. It sounds so crazy. It sounds so extremist to say, I will rid my life of even good things because they're getting in the way of my enjoyment and my obedience to God. This is why Paul goes on to call, what Paul goes on to call youthful passions and foolish and ignorant controversies. Whatever, whatever is distancing you from your faith, whatever is clouding your mind, whatever is numbing your spirit to the things of God, whatever you are using to distract yourself into oblivion, this can be obvious sins like the use of pornography, gossip, greed, and it could be more subtle things like entertainment. 
the consumption of media that is contrary to God's desires for your life. And the reality is that the most, the most dangerous and insidious temptations aren't to go rob, steal, murder, and extort. No, it's scrolling. You know what's going to steal God's call on your life? Scrolling. Because we just give it away to frivolity. It's frivolity, more often than not, that will end up stealing our joy. Susanna Wesley, mother of the famed John and Charles Wesley, was asked by John, her son, to, to answer the question, Mom, what is sin? And this was her answer. Son, whatever weakens your reasoning impairs your tenderness of conscience. Hmm. Whatever obscures your sense of God or takes away your relish for spiritual things. In short, if anything increases the authority and the power of the flesh over the spirit, then to you, that has become sin, however good it is in itself. Anything, anything that steals my taste buds for spiritual things, anything that has become stronger than my desire to be with him, to that I must die to. To consecrate oneself to the Lord is to take special concerted action, this is, I'm calling you to do something, to take special concerted action to distance yourself from anything that pulls you away from God. It's to enter into maybe just this season where you're cleansing yourself, your schedule, your habits, your mind, your language, your behavior of things that seek to steal your joy so as to focus on the Lord and his work. It's to cleanse yourself of the impurities in order to facilitate your relationship with God. It's getting rid of certain types of media that aren't conducive to your relationship with Jesus. It's breaking off even relationships that pull you away from the Lord that he wants for your life. And this is the crazy thing. If you were to right now announce to your friends, hey, I'm going keto. I'm going on a diet. That's amazing. Good man. How can I help you, right? How can I help you consecrate yourself to your health, because that's, that's what it is. And we, we love when people consecrate themselves to their health. But we sound crazy, right? So when you're on a diet, you're saying no to things. You're saying, I cannot eat this, I cannot do that. I'm gonna, in fact, then do this and that and the third. And we love that, because we, 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 we value the physical over the spiritual. You're celebrated. If you consecrate yourself to the health, you're celebrated when you consecrate yourself to university to get a degree, right? When you're in university, you have to say no to some things. You have to say yes to other things because you want to say yes to getting good marks. You want to say yes to getting that degree. You're applauded if you consecrate yourself to your future career. So we're not for, listen, don't pretend. Let's not pretend here. We're not foreigners to the idea of consecration. But the moment we tell people, I'm not listening to secular music anymore. What? You're being so religious. Are you trying to earn God's love? The moment that we say, I'm canceling my Netflix subscription. The moment we say, I'm going to give up video games for a season. The moment we say, I'm breaking up with my partner because they're leading me away from Jesus. The moment that we say, I'm going to become accountable regarding my addiction to pornography. The moment that we say, I'm going to take a vacation, not to go overseas, just to read the scriptures in unhurried time. Once we say those things, you're crazy. You're a maniac. What? What a Jesus freak. We're not, listen, we're not foreigners to the idea of consecration. We just don't like, or we're not accustomed to the idea of consecrating ourselves to the Lord. Say those things, you sound like a nut job, even to Christians. They'll, they'll try to pull you back. They'll try to knock some sense into you. And so, consecration brings into the natural realm what is already true of you in the spiritual realm as you seek to cleanse yourself from anything that would distract you from God's call on your life. It requires cleansing, but it also requires clarity. Particularly, clarity about who you're consecrating yourself to and four. In the Old Testament, common Israelites were given the opportunity to consecrate themselves to the Lord. The priests and the Levites were consecrated to the Lord for life, okay? But common Israelites were given the opportunity to take what was called a Nazarite vow. And a Nazarite vow was for a season, and a, a, a regular, someone who wasn't of the religious class, they were able to consecrate themselves to the Lord for a season for a special way. Samson 
took that vow, even though we see him again and again failing that vow. But the Apostle Paul also took that vow in the New Testament. And three things marked a Nazarite. No alcohol, no coming near a dead body, and no cutting of the hair. And for a time, they would take a vow of separation. And in that separation, they were enacting with their whole lives for a season in microcosm what Israel, what the whole people of God were supposed to be for God. They were supposed to be holy and separate for the sake of the world. They were to be cleansed of all things for the sake of something greater. They gave up good things, good things like wine and haircuts and funerals that weren't even sinful in and of themselves to become available to something greater. And it requires sacrifice. And it will require sacrifice of you. And one of the things that you will need to die to, one of the things that you will need to die to, if you right now are sensing a pull from the Spirit to say, I, I want to be consecrated in a special way to the Lord, one of the things that you're going to, the first thing you're going to have to die to is the idol of being understood even by Christians, because people will look at you and say, what a religion, like you're, this, this guy's just being a Pharisee. This, this guy's just being religious for religiosity's sake. It may seem super odd and weird to those around you that fall out of step. You know, you may fall out of step with what's currently happening in Hollywood news because you choose to no longer consume tabloids. And, and what we do, we, we, we use, we say, I, I read the tabloids for missional purposes so I can have something to talk about at work. It may seem odd that you won't listen to secular music. It may seem off-putting to some that you choose to not drink alcohol for a season. And the hardest part of you will be that you have to risk not being understood. And this is why it requires clarity. Clarity of purpose, clarity of call, clarity of whom you're consecrating yourself to. You're not consecrating yourself for the sake of spiritual development. Okay? You're not consecrating yourself for the sake of spiritual development. You're consecrating yourself for the sake of a person to the Lord. You need to remain clear on that. You're setting yourself aside for the sake of the king. You're giving up scrolling on TikTok or Reels in order to cultivate a quiet and prayerful spirit. You're giving up secular music in order to fill your mind with things that please the Lord, things that are lovely and pure and honorable. You're giving up TV or Netflix as a way to wind down because you want to learn how to wind down in the presence of your holy God, not by escaping into entertainment. You're giving up that relationship because it's not leading you to Christ. You're choosing at all costs to obey God with your sexuality, with your money, with your time. You're choosing to be what you already are. And this was Paul's call to the Corinthians when he wrote this. He said this, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness, listen to this, oh, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Water and oil, light and darkness, death and life, defilement and cleansing. What do these have to do with one another? And this is the thing. Right now, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when we live, compromised lives. We live with one foot in the church and the other in the world. When we call ourselves Christian but begin to date an unbeliever, what, what, what mixing do we have there? When? When? We call ourselves Christian but sleep with our boyfriend or girlfriend. When we call ourselves Christian but bring our witness into disrepute by going on vacations together, having sleepovers with our boyfriends or girlfriends. When we call ourselves Christian but we curse like sailors. When we call ourselves Christians but spend our evenings scrolling mindlessly to escape. When we call ourselves Christians but spend money just like our non-Christian counterparts. When we call ourselves Christians but choose to consume media that lifts up and glorifies the very things that Jesus died for. When we call ourselves Christians but know more about the ditty drama than what Ezekiel talks about, there's a problem. 
there's a problem. This is what we're doing. We're defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord be merciful and gracious and forgive us. And I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to call you to be who you already are in Christ. That there's something better for you. There's something more for you. That our sin, the sin that offends this someone better and gets, it gets in the way of our experience of something better. You would never think, you would, someone who's calling you to someone better isn't trying to condemn you. Saying, you're, you're, you're selling yourself short here. You're selling yourself short by living compromised lives. And when we begin to see that, when we begin to feel that, we will begin to be vessels that are cleansed and ready to be used, like Paul says, for every good work. And we'll begin to realize why we often walk in powerless Christianity. Why we're still struggling with that sin for 10 years. Why we haven't grown up emotionally or spiritually. Why we're still, we, we feel like our, 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 our wheels are just stuck in the mud. Why? Why would God anoint us? Why would God make Anchor Southwest a vessel for honorable use? Why would he allow us to be vehicles of revival if we live compromised lives? What are we asking for? And it may seem to you as you're hearing this and thinking that I'm being over the top or thinking he's lost his mind. Does he think we can be sinless? No, it feels like I finally found my mind. When I was in Adelaide, I had an experience, much like Evan Roberts, where as I struggled to, I was preaching down there and I was listening to preaching down there, and, and I, I remember listening to uh, one of John Tyson's talks, and I remember, I was with Gavin, and I remember I couldn't speak. I felt what Evan Roberts felt. I felt completely unworthy to be your pastor and yet so loved by God. Just so loved by God. And I vowed to come back and say, I cannot let us fall into the program of playing church. I just can't. I cannot spend my life just playing church. I have to. I have to lead myself, my family, and these people. I have to lead us to pursue the presence of God for the sake of the world. It, it, it can't just be a religious consumption that we do here. You, you cannot, listen, I'm speaking to you, not, it's like you cannot just come here to consume a product. You cannot just come here to receive a word. You must come here to Pursue the presence of God with all of your life to be skilled up and geared up and, and, and to actually cultivate a space here where we are equally broken by our sinfulness, but broken even more by the love of Christ for us. And so I came back a different person. I feel like I've found my mind. Of course, of course, I don't believe that we can be sinless but I do believe that we can cultivate the kind of desire that says, I want to be. I, wa I, I never want to offend glory again. If, if I could never offend the majesty of Jesus ever again from now to my dying day, I would love that. I, I desire that. He who says he's without sin is a liar, John calls us. But listen to me, I would argue that he who does not desire perfect obedience hasn't tasted the sweetness of fellowship with him. When you taste the sweetness of fellowship with Jesus, you will get rid of anything that gets in the way. Anything. When I, when Catherine and I were long, what time is it? It's getting late. When Catherine and I were long distance, and this is over 20 years ago, and I was living in New York and she was living here, I had to eradicate all the distance. I had to. I could not content, we could not be content with having a relationship that was 30, I don't know, 35,000 miles, uh, 10,000 kilometers away from me. We couldn't do it. I, we had to close the gap. I loved her too much. She loved me too much. I had to get rid of anything and everything, every obstacle that was there to close the gap. And when we've tasted the sweetness of fellowship with the king, oh, listen, 
Killing sin is, is, is going to be a joy for you. Pursuing a consecrated life is going to be a joy. Living a compromised life will wreck you when you've tasted the sweetness of Jesus. We will begin to see that the greatest life is a life lived wholly given unto the Lord, that there are no half measures. You're going to look, sound, talk crazy to our culture, but there is nothing greater than a consecrated life, to be free from the modern pressures and idols, to simply exist for the pleasure of God, to live with a radical abandon to him, knowing that ultimately, radically abandoning yourself to the Lord is the safest thing we can ever do, to hold all things, even your very life, the most precious thing that you, that you have, is your life, is your breath, to even hold that with open hands, to not only hold possessions, but our very own life with radically open hands, to be ready to do the master's bidding at the drop of a hat. And this is why clarity is so important, because you need to remember that you're not consecrating yourself to an idea or to a theological program or to a church. That won't be strong enough to hold you, but you're, you're consecrating yourself to a person, not to an it. It's practicing now what we will be one day in eternity. And the promise is there in Corinthians at the end of, in chapter 7, that, that the promise is that he will live and walk amongst his consecrated people. Let that be the controlling image for you. And so what do we do with this? John Tyson, in a sermon, said something beautifully simple and profound. He said this, that God's problem, God has a problem, and God's problem is that he won't compromise. He won't compromise. He even came to live amongst a people of sin, right? Us. And yet, even he won't compromise. And therefore, he is looking for people who also won't compromise and who are prepared to receive his presence, prepared to be a people he can use for honorable use, prepared to be a people through which God can bring revival. And so I want us to respond this morning. I, I, I don't want uh, us to take this away. I'm going to invite the band up. I want you to respond in this way. And we don't do coercion. We do invitation. But I want you to respond in this way. If, if you don't know Jesus here, if you haven't met him as Lord and Savior, my call for you is to make a decision for Christ this morning. Today is the day of salvation. I don't, the last thing I ever want to preach, I, I want you to come face to face with the word. I don't want to give you, I don't want to give you something cool to think about. Okay, I want, you, I want to confront you with the word to say repent. Repent from your sin and return to the Lord who loves you. I want you to admit your need for him. I want you to make a decision for Christ this morning to, to, to receive the grace that you are so desperately looking in relationships, in the way your body looks, in, in the way that people see you. In, 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 in what money you have or what postcode you live in, all the things that you're seeking for justification, for pleasure, uh, for a sense of I, I am okay in the world, Christ will give you. But if you've already pledged your allegiance to Jesus, I want you to realize the moment that we're living in. I want us to wake up. We're living in a moment that this kind of action that I'm calling us to today, at the end of this series, that this kind of action, the, 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 the kind of consecration, it will not only confuse others, but it may bring opposition. So count the cost. We're living in a moment where we would just rather do church as we've always known it. And I'm, again, I'm so afraid as a pastor to allow that to happen, to allow us to show up on Sunday, do our thing, maybe go to a gospel community, but live powerless, compromised lives. We live in a time of decline, but we live in a time of opportunity. This is our time. Okay, I'm calling us as a church. This is our time. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. It's interesting that we, we, we live as Christians with access to the kind of power that the death of a king is a footnote. You know the year? The year that... you. You, 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 you try to get into the White House. You, you, you try to get into, the, into Parliament. Right? That, that's, there's one person in this room who works for government. He can do it. But the rest of us, we, can't, we don't have access like that. We live in a world where these power structures really think that they are at the top of the food chain. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. When we live with a king who sits on a throne, 
King Uzziah, it's a footnote. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook as the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he'd taken with, from, with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Listen, that coal is the cross. You stand here right now, even if right now in your heart for the first time you pledge allegiance to Jesus. You stand cleansed. You stand as Isaiah stood in the throne room of heaven, coal touching his lips, saying, your guilt has been taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, now, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Isaiah speaking, here I am, send me. And this is the call. Who's going to go for him? Who is willing to put their sin to death? Who is willing now to say, I want to live a consecrated life to the Lord? Who is willing to say, here I am, send me? No compromise. No longer living in the shadows. Here I am, send me. And so maybe you're here. And you're suffering under a besetting sin. May the Lord set you free as you partner with him and trusted friends to walk with you into freedom. Maybe you're here and you've been serving out of duty or not serving at all. May the Lord empower you to release and to use your gifts for the sake of his church and for the world. Maybe you're here and you're in a relationship with an unbeliever and it's diluting your ability to worship, to serve, to commune with God. May grace empower you to understand this that there is nothing you will lose that you will not gain a thousandfold in the arms of Christ. Maybe you're afraid of being alone. Maybe you have, may, may you then have the grace to understand that communion with God and a clear conscience is greater than anything any man or woman can give you. And this is it. May the Lord give us the grace to build the altars of our lives, our hearts, our homes, our church, so that you, Lord, would send rain so that you would rain fire on them. And may you be pleased to use this church as an honorable vessel for your kingdom purposes in the world, Lord Jesus. The time is short. The time is short. Listen, the time is short. His hand is already on the door. Jesus is coming back. The time is short. The time is short. The time is short. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the strength that you've given us, not only to speak this word, but to receive this word. And Holy Spirit, I pray now that those who may be far from you would be drawn near. Would we put our defenses finally down and walk into the arms of the love, the security, the purpose that we've been looking for in all these other things. I pray for the children in this room who sit unknowingly under the, the preaching of your word, that your love would never depart from them, that they would have in what could be our eyes a boring testimony, that they would never know a day without the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would never know a day without his love, without his mercy, without his grace. I pray for those who are far from you, that you would draw them near. I pray for your church, Lord. I pray for the, 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 the people that you've died for, that you love so deeply. You love them, you love them enough. You love them enough to call them to live consecrated lives. You love them enough 
to call them away from compromise. And so, Father, more than anything, I pray that you would instill in us a desire for you. May it be true of us. May it be true of us that there is nothing that I desire beside you. For my flesh and my heart may fail, but you are the strength of my por- and my portion forever. Would it be true of us that we pant like deers by, 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 by streams for your presence, O oh God? Would it be true of us that we would prefer one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere? Would it be true of us that there is nothing more than I desire than to be and to live in your presence? It may be true of us that the strongest, realest, deepest, most vibrant cry of our hearts is Maranatha. Lord Jesus, come. We cannot wait to see you. We love you. And until the day that, we, that our faith turns to sight, we worship you. And so now as we sing, as we take communion, as we take the body and the blood of Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us in ways that may even bypass our cognitive faculties. That even as we sing, would these words infuse our minds and hearts and imaginations? Would we walk out changed? Would we walk out transformed? Would we get on our faces and plead, Lord, even if there is no desire right now in our hearts to live consecrated lives, would we pray that we would get the desire? Holy Spirit, do a work now in Jesus' name. And the church said, and the church said, let's stand up and sing.